Lovely, thank you. Uh, so firstly, uh, thank you to everyone who uh, was involved in the, the operators uh, group. I think we had some good discussion, so uh, hopefully this comes across useful to, to everyone else and, and doesn't totally contradict what Martin is going to say shortly. <laughs> um, so what we did first was try to put ourselves in the shoes of uh, the operators. Um, so how, um, how we did that is thinking about um, what it is that, that we need to achieve and, and ultimately um, doing things as fast as possible, as often as possible and getting it on time and reliably on time um, is a big part of what the, the operators uh, or what we saw that the operators needed to achieve. And then from there, we tried to understand how uh, we impact on uh, the other groups that have been here today and, and vice versa. And one of the key things that we came up with uh, is in the middle on the wonderfully drawn green diagram, which is this constant trade between cost and noise. And then uh, a third element, which we have called flexibility, um, which is where there is uh, noise implications and we have to operate outside of what maybe the normal condition is. So we might approve something for um, with the cost versus noise conversation, but then in the operational environment, things change and we have to adapt. Thinking about um, all of the elements which are in a, a bit more detail here, it kind of boils down to what we, um, or what I've sort of put together at the bottom in terms of, uh, in this red drawing, um, which a lot of it is around incentives. We have cost drivers for a lot of the noise, uh, the, the noise um, work that we want to do. But tying into the, um, the incentives is the communication, whether that's with our, um, our infrastructure, um, managers, so the wheel and rail noise um, are two implications independent of each other, but we have to work together to to really consider the noise problem as a system, as we've already covered. Uh, information, um, a lot of what we do uh, has to focus around the information that we're given uh, and, and the information we can collect. So from a research perspective or a, a detection dete uh, perspective, um, capturing more information about maybe wheel roughness or understanding what it is about our, noise, our trains which are noisy and having more information on that both that we can gather ourselves or that we can gather from our other partners in industry is really important. We covered equality which is thinking about not just ourselves as an industry but the, the, uh, the roads and the uh, air, aircraft. Um, how do policies um, make sure that we're all sort of treated fairly, but from an operator's perspective, um, that we're considered equally to how the road and air is, but accordingly, because obviously the railway infrastructure is a, a different um, operating environment to the, the roads and the aircraft. But it also comes down to cost effectiveness. So it has to be, um, it has to be cost effective. Um, when we look at optimizing and, and solutions, we still have to look at our top line, which is um, doing things fast, often and on time, but also there's a cost implication to us. So if we if we want to achieve those and we want to reduce the noise, there's often going to be a, a cost impact of that, and we have to weigh up those two those two very carefully. So from the individuals of the the sort of six groups that we had, we were thinking about policy. We said equal policy. That's road, rail, and aircraft. We've also said about um, quieter trains in general. That needs to be an international approach, not necessarily. A, a localized approach so for a, an operator in one country um, that's fine but if they if they operate to different control measures than say other countries that maybe is a, an inequality is there something in classification of vehicles that can be looked at which is how we classify noise characteristics of vehicles and and maybe uh, operate under those um, banners uh, from an infrastructure perspective it was a lot about communication as i've said so sharing more information uh, infrastructure managers detecting information and sharing that information with us was really important. We also said about uh, alternative freight routes. So if freight could be redirected, for example, to uh, other paths or whether freight could operate more effectively in, in different environments with higher speeds or similar, is that an opportunity? Um, suppliers is, uh, we are heavy, or we, we saw it as something we're heavily reliant on and that all feeds into the research as well. So. Um, whether that's optimized components or optimized wheel rail conditions uh, and parameters that we can we can get gather more information from we rely heavily on the suppliers and the researchers um, to give us some more information about that that we can then deliver 
we thought about the neighbors um, and a lot of it is, is uh, not just um, the noise, but also things like passenger comfort has to be uh, factored in, which is one of the, the other considerations when we think, think about freight versus passenger vehicles as well, which are two very different elements that we didn't cover in this slide, but we did talk about a lot which is the two are very different and we have to treat them independently, but at the same time, consider the noise together. Uh, the research I've already covered uh, and from the operator perspective, it's also um, some of the wider considerations, which maybe we don't automatically factor in in our European or national legislation, or sorry, European or international legislation, which is some of the compatibility issues and also some of the different operating considerations that we have in different European countries. So. Composite brake blocks came up a lot and the, the Nordic winter conditions, but equally where we have incredibly hot European summers, um, how those considerations are factored into the overall conversation around noise uh, is sometimes, or we said was potentially sometimes overlooked and makes it very difficult for some countries to abide by Euronorm legislation compared to say uh, other countries which have maybe lot more moderate conditions. Uh, so I think that roughly summarizes it. I think that the first point on cost flexibility and noise and uh, how we incentivize the, um, the implementation of improved noise conditions was really the, the focus that we drew away. And I hope I haven't missed anything from the behalf of the operators group. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jamie. <laughs> then I will, I will start with an observation. I noticed that Jamie, it impressed me that you went through systematically all the stakeholders in your thinking if you were an operator do you as an operator do that also yes <laughs> because i know it's not a good i must say we also uh, work quite uh, often together with the program they have because of for park trains for example they have they are, have to do the environmental calculations with input data so they already ask uh, at least we have to provide them the data of single noise sources and we know it the effect uh, when it's too high it's not too high there's no limit set by by the infrastructure manager but if it's higher then yeah you have uh, uh, less parking space or there's a lot of uh, money going to uh, noise barriers so we have the discussion there um, we don't want to have too much complaints, so we have to talk to the, to the citizens uh, we have uh, these, these uh, citizens uh, gatherings, evenings, I think it's mainly organized for Kowale, eh? those meetings, uh, but the NS will, if necessary, uh, uh, discuss with them. So we do have these, uh, we follow these steps. We think about, uh, well, the next 20 years, we want to run more trains, what does it mean? That's why we put those strict limits on fast line noise, for example, to, um, yeah, to limit the, the noise, which we, noise ceilings we have in the Netherlands. So, um, we do it, but I was impressed as well. <laughs> so, yeah, how, how you did that. <laughs> I can thank everyone else for that, not yeah. me. <laughs> uh, yeah. On on that uh, topic of uh, the presentation that we um, put together, there was a lot of um, intention around incentives. Um, so, what is the incentive for um, NS, for example? You show a lot of good um, opportunities where you've enhanced uh, the current vehicles to make them quieter mm -hmm. um what's like the incentive for for ns to do that on behalf of prorail or for the neighbor because it will be a cost implication i'm sure to ns yeah, it's a combination uh, for example the the, the hvac noise i showed with the reduced uh, fan speed it was not about legislation this time but really complaints mm -hmm. for uh so and there it was it, it was additional cost for ns but uh, that we compared it with uh, yeah being a good neighbor um, and that was the reason for that one. Sometimes it's uh, legislation, although uh, for TSI it's not so difficult to comply to TSI, mm -hmm. the, the train. Do you find by the, by the way, if the, if, the, if the manufacturers think the same, but I see they reach it quite easily, but maybe the manufacturers say we have to struggle a lot. I don't know, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think it, they can reach it easily. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Between brackets, but... Uh, yeah. Do you... Um... Do you use indicators so to, to justify like the business case? Do you have an indicator to say it's worth spending the money to be a good neighbor versus not spending the money because it's too expensive to be a good neighbor? But to be honest, the, the specific case for HVAC, there, there it, uh, it was really an issue with a lot of complaints, media attention. Okay, yeah. So we, we, we had to do that. Uh, in general, the, the, for the other limits, 
I have never had a discussion about about, about money. Okay. So it's uh, yeah. So it's not it's not a driver to at the moment. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> so. Thank you. Uh, questions? Any other questions that came up? Maybe. Yes. Something that I had thought about earlier, I, I, when you mentioned the tonality, it, it keyed me on that again. Uh, we know from experience that some people who become highly uh, annoyed with sound, over time their sensitivity seems to increase. And if you incrementally reduce the sound, they incrementally increase their sensitivity and you get essentially nowhere. Other people can live near a noise source. It's repetitive and continuous and chronic. And over time, they lose their sensitivity and they don't even realize it's there anymore. So I'm just curious about the, uh, the psycho noise uh, uh, issue and how you deal with that as an operator, knowing that there will be some people who get sensitive, other people who get non-sensitive, mm -hmm. and you can't really tell them apart until they start complaining. Good Thank you. Um, I only remember we had a new type of train, um, which uh, replaced an older train, of course. <laughs> but uh, at, at the station, there were no complaints in the beginning. But then there was this new train with a new uh, starting noise, and people started to complain. And uh, one uh, uh, colleague who worked, in the, he retired recently, or he said, well, that's in the beginning, there's always a lot of complaints. But pro most certainly, it will reduce after a time because they get used to it. So that's a little bit the other way around, as, as you said. And uh, it's right, in the beginning, there were a lot of complaints, but later on, it reduced, so they get used to it. But I haven't heard, don't have the experience yet, that when you make it more silent, it's, uh, they, they get more sensitive. But Jean-Philippe, you, you, uh, I think you work on this field more. more. We can have such a such question, and uh, when the the sound is modified, the perception is uh, is changing, and we can have such a such reaction from uh, from the event. Yeah, it, it depends. Okay, thank you very much. We'll have one more question, and then we'll change the subject. No, sorry, it wasn't a question. It was just a, a remarks for tonality. Uh, in some case, uh, when we are close to the train during a certification type test, uh, we can hear uh, the noise. But uh, and when we discuss with some, uh, okay, no acoustician, they say, okay, your train is very noisy. And finally, you say, okay, uh, it's very, very, uh, it's 55 dBA, so it's very good. But uh, you know that is something else. That uh, that's why nose and perception now we need to dig more about uh, perception and uh, with different indicators mm. that's why we want to work in this ARGU project yes no, I, I agree it's a uh, tonality it doesn't the, 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 the absolute sound level is not that high but this one tone at a lower level is very annoying and that makes it uh, mm. something to look at yeah mm. Okay, thank you yeah. to both of you once again okay. for your efforts. Yep.